right. Uh, so um, w welcome everyone. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to uh, introduce uh, Aaron Roth, who's our, our speaker uh, today. Um, so Aaron is the Henry Salvatore Professor of Computer Science at the University of, of Pennsylvania. He did his uh, PhD in, in Carnegie Mellon, uh, then a postdoc at um, Microsoft, and has gone on to have a very distinguished uh, career. Uh, Aaron's work spans many areas of computer science and statistics and algorithmic game theory. Um, he has a lot of very important work uh, uh, about, about privacy and uh, data and, and differential privacy. He has written a very influential book, uh, which is called The Algorithmic Foundations of Differential Privacy with the Swint Cynthia at work. Um, so it's a, it's a very popular and very, very important book. Uh, he has done very important work in algorithmic game theory, uh, which is the area that I know best. I, I got I recommend my favorite paper of Aaron's is a paper about um, using auctions to sell uh, to sell, pay, sell sell privacy. So you know when you have agents who have privacy concerns and you might want to buy data from them, but only they know how much they value their, their privacy. Um, uh, that's a, a particular a reading recommendation. Uh, he has also done a lot of work in, in, in fairness in machine learning and, and in learning uh, more, more generally. And today we'll see an, an example of that. Uh, and the talk is uh, 50 minutes, so we'll, uh, it's not a lot of time, so I suggest we let um, Aaron talk unless there are some clarifying questions, and then we can take questions after, after Aaron is, is done. So. All right, thank you. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's great being at Berkeley to give this talk. It's basically, you know, the I'll talk about some additional things at the end, but the core of this talk is really combining ideas from multi-calibration, which is due to here in the audience, and conformal prediction, which uh, a lot of important work has been done by, by folks here at Berkeley and in the audience. Uh, so, you know, ho hopefully everyone will learn at least one new thing, but there will be like lots of people who <laughs> know at least parts of what's in the talk. Um, okay, so, so just sort of maybe to like set the stage, um, I'd like to talk about uncertainty quantification in machine learning. We've gotten at this point very good at making point predictions. We've gotten very good at training models that in many applications by and large are you know, accurate. They, they are usually right, but they're not always right. They make mistakes. And to the extent that we want to use predictions made by these models in downstream decision-making processes, we'd really like to have some um, way to calibrate our confidence for you know, how likely the model is to be right, like in this particular prediction. Okay, so we need some way of um, quantifying uncertainty. I, I, I really, I'm gonna talk about prediction sets and I really like this picture by a, from a paper um, by several folks in the audience. Um, and, and so there's different ways you can think about quantifying uncertainty and I'll talk about a few at the end, if the, a few other ones at the end if there's time, but one, attractive way to quantify uncertainty in a prediction problem is to give a prediction set. So rather than giving, um, you know, just like a point prediction, I might give um, a set of labels. So for example, you know, I, I might be pretty sure that this critter here is a fox squirrel, and so my prediction set there is, you know, just confidently says fox squirrel. Um, but, you know, this thing, it's a little occluded, you know, who knows what this is. Maybe it's a fox squirrel, maybe it's a marmot, maybe it's a mink. Um, and so the prediction set, you know, both gives you some idea of how much uncertainty there is, sort of, sort of the size of the set, but also gives you an idea of where the uncertainty lies. And it might be okay that the prediction set does not have size one, depending on what the downstream application is. Like, it might be that in my application, it's enough that I know that this is like a critter. I might not need to know whether it's a marmot or a fox squirrel. The downstream application, the, the downstream action might, for either one, be apply the brakes. Right, so like, you know, this, this is a good way of quantifying uncertainty, even if my certainty in any of these particular labels is, is low. Okay, so prediction sets are informative, more informative than single numbers. And this is for, um, you know, like a classification problem, a prediction set in a regression problem is often sort of a familiar prediction interval. Um, and our, our goal here is that we should produce prediction sets that have some semantics. Uh, for example, they should contain the true label 95% of the time. And what I want to drill down on the beginning of this talk is sort of 
um, the meaning of, of the, you know, 95% of the time. What is this probability taken over? Okay, so, so maybe just like for background, for those of you who don't know it, let me give like a one slide crash course in conformal prediction, which is, you know, like a simple, elegant way to affix arbitrary black box models with prediction sets. There's a lot of work on this and there's lots of different methods. I'm going to give sort of simplest possible example. This is sort of a method called split conformal prediction. Okay, so you start off and you pick up your favorite model. Okay, it do doesn't have to, this is a very general technique. It doesn't have to be a regression model. It could be a classification model, but like just for simplicity, let's assume our favorite model is a regression model. So it's, it maps features to real numbers. Given an X, it, it gives us a, a point prediction. And then um, we come up with what's called a, a non-conformity score. And again, this could really be anything. The, you know, the flexibility of conformal prediction comes from the fact that it doesn't matter what this is. But like what you want it to be in order to get good behavior is that the non-conformity score, which takes as input a feature vector and a candidate label, should sort of tell you something about how different the candidate label is from the predicted label of the model. And so maybe in like the simplest case, uh, in the regression problem, I might say, okay, well, my nonconformity score for a, a feature vector X and a candidate label Y hat is just the difference between, you know, like the, the distance between my candidate label and the label predicted by my model, how different it is from, from my prediction. Okay, but it could be anything. And then what am I going to do? Well. I'm going to get a holdout set, and, and so you know, here you should start thinking, uh oh, you know, maybe I'm making assumptions like the data is drawn IID. We'll talk about that later. But like, a, let's get a holdout set for now. Hopefully, the holdout set is is drawn uh, from the same distribution that my model will be evaluated on. And what I'm going to look at is the sort of one-dimensional distribution of this non-conformity score evaluated on the true labeled examples in my holdout set. My holdout set has labeled examples, and so when I plug them into my non-conformity score, they produce numbers, and I'm going to look at the distribution over these numbers. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to find a quantile of this distribution, let's say the 95th percentile quantile, okay, so a threshold such that on my holdout set, 95% of the examples lie below this quantile. And then on new examples, you know, I see an X, I don't know what the label is, I'm going to produce the following prediction set. The prediction set will include all of the labels, all of the candidate labels whose um, non-conformity score, when paired with this example, fall below this threshold I found, this 95th percentile quantile of the non-conformity score distribution when you evaluate it on the, the true examples, uh, and, and that's going to be my prediction set. Okay, so this is very general. Here we're doing it for a regression problem, but all of this is well defined for a classification problem as well. Um, and in this case, the prediction set is just, you know, like a, an interval centered at my prediction with width equal to twice this threshold tau, this quantile I estimated. Okay, and it's not hard to, you know, like, like ha having the idea for this framework, that's like a great idea, but once you have it, it's not hard to convince yourself that um, you know, if you've done this because the, you know, nonconformity, the true nonconformity scores on my holdout set are distributed the way they would be on new data, that uh, on a new example, I will, con you know, my prediction set will contain the true label 95% of the time. Okay. Um, you know, it's, so in some sense, we're just estimating quantiles, so it's, you know, that we've known how to do that forever, um, but we are giving prediction intervals here that are non-parametric, right? So, this, so these, this is not the kind of prediction interval you'd get from linear regression, assuming a linear model. The strength and flexibility of this technique comes from the fact that you didn't need to assume anything about the model. But it's very simple. I mean, like, th there's nothing that a classical statistician wouldn't be able to prove about this, for example. Okay. Um, okay, but th this is a marginal guarantee. So this is something I want to sort of zoom in on. When we say that, um, you know, the prediction interval contains the label 95% of the time, we mean like over the randomness of everything. Um, over the randomness of the new data, po the, the new feature vector, but also the new label, uh, also the randomness of the holdout set. Okay, so, so this 95% of the time is over all of the randomness like in the whole setup. Okay, and so um, 
okay, this is great. It's, it's you know, um, simple, elegant, but sometimes we might want more than a marginal guarantee. Let's sort of think about that. Um, so, so, you know, I don't know, there was, there was a pandemic a little while ago. Let's imagine that we're at the beginning of some pandemic. People are uh, coming into our hospital. We're, we're trying to, you know, make predictions about like their blood oxygen level in 24 hours time to figure out how to, you know, who we should admit to the, you know, ER, who we shouldn't. Um, and we've got some model for it, maybe. Okay, so we say, okay, given your features X, our model predicts your blood oxygen level in 24 hours time. It's, it's going to be something, F of X. And so our patient might uh, ask, um, you know, like this is an important decision. How sure are you of this prediction? And our doctor might, having learned about conformal prediction, say, um, well, I've got a 95% prediction interval that your blood oxygen level will be within this range. And maybe if we're lucky, this range, um, you know, we, this range covers uh, something that all corresponds to the same decision in which case, right, like the uncertainty about the exact number doesn't matter. We're certain about the action we should take. But, um, you, you know, so our patient is trying to figure out and, and, and our doctor is trying to figure out whether we, you know, we can really sort of, you know, make downstream decisions on the basis of this interval. And when you're thinking about, like, making um, a downstream decision, like for you as an individual, what you might hope the semantics of this prediction interval are are that somehow there's a 95% chance that the truth, y, is going to be consistent with what the model says, the interval, consistent on like everything the medical system knows about you, consistent on, or conditional on everything the, the medical system knows about you, conditional on, you know, all of the, you know, everything written in your medical chart, all of the observations the doctor has taken, right, and then you know, right, you'd like it to be for you personally, there's a 95% chance that the model is correct. Okay, and like if you think like what, what, what does that actually mean? Like, you know, well, the, what's the randomness taken over? Like, okay, maybe somehow the unrealized or unmeasured, unmeasured randomness of the world, like you get into interesting philosoph philosophical problems, but um, suffice it to say this is not what the guarantee means. And if you took seriously trying to do this in a you know, high dimensional feature space where you never essentially see any feature vector more than once, you'd realize that it's not possible to give a guarantee like this, at least without making the kinds of strong modeling assumptions, parametric assumptions that maybe you would if you were a classical statistician. So, so what like conformal prediction actually promises is a marginal guarantee, something that looks syntactically quite similar to this, but semantically is quite different because the probability does not condition on x. The probability is over um, both x and y, which means it's an average over people. It means that for 95% of people for whom we make predictions, the label is contained within the interval. Okay, so, so our doctor has told our patient, you know, we, I've got this 95% prediction interval. And our patient, for example, could think to herself at this point, well, you know, hmm, um, I'm part of a demographic group, maybe a medically relevant demographic group that represents less than 5% of the population. So it is entirely consistent with the promise of a, of a marginal prediction interval that, you know, the, the model might have just failed to like learn some medically relevant fact about people like me. And although it is covering the label of 95% of people, maybe it is, you know, dramatically undercovering the label for people like me and making up for that by dramatically overcovering the label for others. A marginal guarantee doesn't distinguish between those two cases because it's averaging over everybody. Okay. Okay. Now, if the, if, 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 if the medically relevant groups that we decided we cared about were disjoint, then there'd be an easy solution. Just treat these as different learning problems, right? Like I could, I could, you know, run a split conformal prediction method for each of the groups, and that would sort of solve this problem. Um, but they might not be disjoint. So, um, you know, like, suppose we're, suppose, suppose we're willing to run different studies on different parts of the population. So hopefully we can answer questions like this, you know, well, okay, what about for people like me? And so the doctor could say, well, you know, for African Americans under the age of 50, the 95% prediction intervals from A to B. And for women with a family history of diabetes, the 95% prediction intervals from C to D. And for people with egg allergies and no history of smoking, the 95% prediction intervals from E to F. 
And these are not mutually exclusive groups, right? Like our patient could simultaneously be a member of each of these groups. And if that is the case, it's not clear how to act. And again, remember that it is, again, consistent with the guarantees of a marginal prediction interval, if each of these are just marginal prediction intervals averaging over people, that, for example, A to B could be like disjoint from E to F. Right? These don't even have to be intersecting. Question? Or just uh, OK, so, so like, you know, I could give a different marginal prediction interval for every group in principle that our patient is a member of, but it's not at all clear how you would like combine these to act on them. Right, so, so it's sort of, you know, what does this mean for me? Okay. Okay, so, so okay, that was sort of me complaining about marginal prediction intervals. Um, let me also spend a moment complaining about the assumption that data is drawn IID, or more generally, this sort of method of split conformal prediction um, needs that the data is exchangeable, that it is permutation invariant. Okay, so um, roughly an assumption that the future must look like the past, which is very convenient, but not always true. Um, okay, so, so you can imagine for yourselves all sorts of realistic situations in which the data distribution might change over time. Uh, let, let me instead like ruin a joke for you and narrate a, a cartoon. The punchline is that not all data is exchangeable. Um, so here we have a, a, you know, a young man uh, approaching Santa Claus. He's, he's going to tell him like what his w Christmas wish is. And you know, I don't know, like looking at him is probably going to be like a skateboard or something like that. Um, but uh, Santa Claus says, no, you know, like, you don't even have to tell me. We, I've, I've trained a data-driven model uh, from your wish history. And you know, he's got like this Barney. And the, you know, the young man looks sad about this. A, a, right? And the punchline is that your, um, you know, the sequence of things you want for Christmas is not an exchangeable data distribution. Okay? <laughs> Good. I, I wasn't sure if I was going to get a laugh for that one. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, so, so, so I, I want to talk about three kinds of results in this talk. Um, so in the first kind of result, I want to talk about ways to make stronger than marginal guarantees, even when you're still willing to assume that the data is drawn IID. Um, then I want to think about how to make, give, give these same kinds of stronger than marginal guarantees in a sequential prediction setting where you assume nothing about the data. It could be adversarially chosen, but you still want these same strong guarantees. And then at the end, I want to talk a little bit about um, uncertainty quantification beyond prediction sets and really beyond quantiles. So we'll talk about this in a minute, but like conformal prediction is really about quantile estimation. The role of the non-conformity score is to project this like high dimensional prediction set problem into like a one dimensional quantile estimation problem. And like what we're going to do, sort of the, the mathematical content of, of the re most of the results I'm going to tell you are sort of getting analogs of sort of this very nice mean multi-calibration work, but for quantiles, which, which is sort of what directly applies to conformal prediction. But it turns out you can think about calibrating quantities beyond means and quantiles, and, and some of them are also useful for uncertainty estimation. And so if there's time at the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. OK. So, um, okay, so there's, there's lots of nonconformity scores out there. But like in the you know, one slide crash course on conformal prediction, we sort of used the, the simplest and dumbest possible nonconformity score, just how different is the, the label from the prediction. Um, but there's, there's a whole bunch of other ones. For example, you could use quantile regression to come up with these nonconformity scores that is, has the ability to give you prediction intervals whose width is adaptive to the examples you're predicting. That's nice. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, this applies if you come up with the right nonconformity score to um, classification problems as well. So there's a whole, you know, cottage industry doing very nice work coming up with nonconformity scores. Um, but like, if you think of split conformal prediction, it's really like a wrapper method that sort of is one layer of abstraction away from what the nonconformity score is. It works for any nonconformity score. And what I want to think about is sort of stronger wrapper methods. Okay, so 
any non, you, you can use your fav in what I'm going to talk about, you can use your favorite nonconformity score. I'm just going to think about like a different thing you should do compared to just finding like you know a, a fixed you know 95th percentile quantile on a holdout set. Okay, so, so like right, the nice thing about conformal prediction is it reduces what would otherwise be this very high dimensional problem of coming up with prediction sets, right? Like if I've got k labels, there's two to the k possible prediction sets to like a one dimensional problem. I take my nonconformity score, it like projects, um, you know, th this high dimensional problem down into like a one dimensional distribution on nonconformity scores that I just find a single threshold on, a single quantile value for. Okay, so, you know, like, the core algorithmic problem really is just given a distribution over numbers. These non the value the, eval the evaluations of these nonconformity scores find you know like a ninety fifth percentile quantile. Okay, so um, we are we, our goal is going to be to give guarantees that are stronger than these marginal guarantees, and so it's not going to be enough for us anymore to just find like single quantiles that we uh, apply to everything. Um, the prediction sets we're going to produce are still going to have the same form. Like on, on some example x, our prediction set will consist of all labels whose nonconformity score when paired with x is below some threshold. But that threshold is now also going to depend on the example x. Okay, so, so sort of the alg our algorithmic problem is really going to be to learn a model f and what F is doing is it's mapping examples X to like the thresholds that we should use um, to form the prediction set using nonconformity score on example X. Okay. And so, um, yes, yeah, so, so let me tell you about two ways in which I'm going to want these prediction sets to have guarantees that are stronger than marginal guarantees. And they're going to build up together to something that will be like a quantile analog of this very nice idea of multi-calibration, which is the equivalent thing for means. Uh, we're going to use the same ideas, but because we're trying to build these prediction sets, we want those guarantees to hold for quantiles instead. OK. So, um, okay, so the first thing we're going to want is what I'll call group conditional validity. OK, so I want, as examples, come in, I want to be able to map them to prediction sets. Again, the prediction set I deploy on some example x is the set of all, is the set of all labels whose nonconformity score when paired with the example is below f of x. And what I want, oh, and, and this guarantee will be parameterized by an arbitrary collection of groups. Yes. Oh, yeah, f of x now, think about it as, um, yeah, it, it, it's not the underlying not the model. Y exactly. All of that is like now abstracted away and wrapped into the nonconformity score. Uh, yeah, I should have used a different letter. Yeah. This was, um, f is such a good letter for a function, though. Um, okay, so, so our goal is to be able to produce prediction sets now. Oh, right, so, so we've got these groups. There can be a lot of them, and they can intersect. So you can think about them as the demographic groups that, for example, our patient arriving at the hospital belongs to. Right? She's a, she's a member of at least three of them. And so we want that we should cover 95% of the labels overall, marginally, but also conditionally on membership in these groups. So if I ha have all of these examples, which have different properties, like shape and color and luminescence, I should cover 95% of the labels, but also 95% of the labels corresponding to triangles and 95% of the labels corresponding to you know, circular patients and square patients. I should also cover 95% of the labels corresponding to blue patients and green patients and red patients. I should cover 95% of the labels corresponding to glowing patients and opaque patients. Right, right. So I should cover 95% um, of the labels on any of these different groups I zoom in on, uh, even though they intersect. Okay, so that's like a group conditional coverage. Okay. Now, well, one thing you, okay, so, so you know, you think uh, maybe this is all I need. Um, one thing maybe you start to worry about, though, if I start saying I'm producing these prediction sets by setting different thresholds for different examples, is that maybe the way I've set up the problem, there's a way to cheat. Like one way to get 95% you know, coverage, even, you know, like, 
c you know, conditional on any group is to just, um, you know, like for 95% of examples, maybe, maybe I'm even randomizing, for 95% of examples, I produce like the trivial prediction interval that contains like all of the labels. And for 5% of examples, I produce like the empty prediction interval, which has no labels. Um, and now I am sort of getting 95%, you know, like true conditional coverage according to the rules of the game, but like in an entirely uninformative way. Like I haven't given you any information. And so we'd like to fix that problem as well. And if you look at sort of the um, old meteorolo meteorological and statistical literature, there are sort of ways to fix that problem. One of them is calibration. So think about for a moment maybe like a, a weather forecasting problem. You, you turn your TV on every day and some guy tells you, you know, today there's a 20% chance of rain or today there's a 60% chance of rain. Like how can I tell if he knows what he's talking about? Well, like a simple test would be I, I could just check if um, yeah, I get over, you know, like the course of a month, I could average the probabilities of rain that he um, predicted. And I could also compute the empirical frequency of rain. And like, hopefully, those things would be close. But there's a simple way for him to cheat and give entirely uninformative forecasts and pass that test. Right? He could just predict whatever happened yesterday. If it rained yesterday, then I predict a 100% chance of rain. If it didn't rain yesterday, I predict a 0% chance of rain. I'm entirely uninformative, but I passed this test because I'm just one day off, so my averages are correct. But like, it's obvious that I'm doing something um, that's not useful. And one way you can sort of zero in on that is that quite frequently, I'm predicting a 100% chance of rain, and it's not raining. Quite frequently, I'm predicting a 0% chance of rain, and it is raining. And so calibration at, for, for means asks that um, the predictions should be correct on average, conditional on the predictions. If I look at all of the days for which I predicted a 20% chance of rain, on that subset of predictions, it should have rained 20% of the time, similarly for 30%, similarly for 40%. Well, y you can ask that for quantile estimates as well. Right? It's not, that idea is not specific to means. So I can say, OK. Um, you know, like, like underlying this is really just quantile estimation. Um, I'll say that my prediction sets are quantile calibrated if I cover 95% of the labels, um, not just overall, but conditional on the threshold I predicted, conditional on the quantile I predicted for that group. Okay, so now I, I can't cheat in this way anymore by 95% of the time predicting the 100 percentile quantile and 5% of the time predicting the 0 percentile quantile. Like, when I predict that for some distribution, the 95th percentile quantile is something, I have to be correct on the marginal distribution conditional on my prediction. And so this thing that I'm going to call prediction set multi-validity, which under the hood is really just, you could call it, you know, if you were just learning this function f and, and not using it to produce prediction sets, you would call it quantile multi-calibration is this analog of multi-calibration, but like for quantile estimators. OK, so we'll say that a, a collection of prediction sets produced in this way um, is multi-valid with respect to some collection of groups if it simultaneously satisfies this multi-group coverage condition while also being, um, while also being threshold calibrated. So that means I should be able to zoom in on the subset of examples corresponding to any one of these groups. And then I should be able to further zoom in on the subset of those examples for which I predicted a particular threshold, f of x. And even on this you know, subset of groups, I, the, on this subset I've zoomed in on, my prediction sh sets should be valid. I should cover 95% of the examples. And this should be true for any of these group threshold combinations that I choose to zoom in on, even though these are sort of intersecting groups. OK? So you know, just thinking back a moment what this means for our patient. Um, a patient, you know, the patient walks in. We don't give her like 10 different prediction intervals for um, each different uh, demographic group she's a member of. We give her one prediction interval. And sh she's got the promise that she can interpret this as a marginal prediction interval averaged over not everybody, but any one of the demographic groups that she's a member of and also conditional on the prediction we've made for her. And all of these interpretations of our prediction intervals are simultaneously correct. 
right? One prediction interval that simultaneously satisfies the semantics of a marginal prediction interval on all of these different distributions. Okay. Um, okay, so it turns out not to be hard to do either. Um, I'm going to show you two algorithms which are, again, um, analogs of known algorithms for mean calibration, um, but adopted to quantile, mul quantile calibration, quantile multi-calibration. And the way they're related is through changing the loss function that you're minimizing. And, and this will um, be relevant to sort of the, the last result I'm going to tell you about, which is sort of um, characterizing exactly those distributional properties for which there exist analogs of mean multi-calibration. Okay, it, it's going to be sort of very important that there be some loss function that satisfies the property that we need it to satisfy in, in these algorithms. Okay, but, but let me tell you just like what the algorithms are. They're pretty simple. Okay, so here's one simple algorithm that um, doesn't get full um, prediction set multi-validity. It just gets, it just promises group conditional coverage. Um, okay, so, so it, it does not necessarily promise this like threshold calibration thing, but it's super simple. Okay, so first of all, like we're just going to solve a convex optimization problem. What loss function are we going to be minimizing? Well, if we wanted mean multi-calibration, um, you know, there's a, or, or yeah, mean group conditional validity, um, there's a very similar algorithm that minimizes squared loss. And the special thing about squared loss is it's a proper scoring rule for means. If, if, if you uh, minimize squared loss o over some distribution, uh, you know, the constant that minimizes it is the mean of that distribution. Uh, so means are elicitable. Um, well, you can do that for medians as well. If I minimize absolute loss, um, then, then I get, uh, you know, the, the thing that minimizes absolute loss is the median of a distribution. Um, and it turns out, you know, like medians are like a 50th percentile quantile and there's nothing special about medians. If I take the absolute loss and like just tilt it a little bit, um, you get a function that is called pinball loss. It kind of looks like the absolute value function tilted a little bit. And for every quantile you'd want to elicit, there's an angle you can tilt the absolute value that will elicit that quantile. Okay, so, so it'll be minimized at that quantile. And so the algorithm is just, okay, we're going to minimize pinball loss over some class of functions. What class of functions? Well, if you want me to satisfy group conditional um, coverage guarantees for some collection of groups, G, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down the indicator function for each of these groups, and I'm going to minimize pinball loss over linear combinations of these indicator functions. Okay, so that if I have G groups, I have G variables, lambda G, okay, and I'm just solving this sort of, um, you know, um, sort of basically quantile regression problem, minimizing pinball loss over linear combinations of these group indicator functions. Okay, and that's it. Oh, and you, yeah, and, and so, you, you know, you, you could do this from scratch, or if you, have a, if you have a quantile regression model that you know and love, you know, you trained, you know, something, you can start with that and just improve it. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so what happens if you do that? Well, uh, it's not hard to show that, you know, like, no matter what your distribution is, no matter what, oh, but we, we are still in, like, the IID setting here, or exchangeable setting, so there is a distribution. We've got some training set. Um, for any set of groups, these can be intersecting is the point. Um, this will output a model such that the corresponding prediction sets satisfy group conditional coverage with respect to this group structure. Okay, so, so by the way, like, if these groups were disjoint so that you know, for any x, only exactly one of these group indicator functions evaluated to one. This would just be sort of separately doing like split conformal prediction on each of the groups. It would just be learning a single threshold, which would correspond to a 95% quantile on each of the groups. The interesting thing is it works even when the groups are not disjoint. Okay. Um, how about if you want this sort of full, um, th this full, um, 
multi-validity guarantee, so group conditional coverage and threshold calibrated coverage at the same time. Well, again, there's a simple algorithm which you can derive by sort of starting from, uh, you know, like the canonical algorithm for mean multi-calibration, but analyzing it rather than with squared error, which is a proper scoring rule for means, analyzing it with respect to pinball loss, which is a proper scoring rule for quantiles. Okay, so what does the algorithm look like? Um, again, pretty simple. I'm going to start with some model, and I'm going to look, like, is it already quantile multi-calibrated? Do the prediction sets that produce already satisfy this sort of group conditional, or already satisfy this sort of multi-validity guarantee? Um, and if the answer is yes, great. But if the answer is no, that means that there's some group G that I can zoom in on and some threshold V that I can zoom in on, such that when I zoom in on all of the people in group G for which I predicted threshold V, like the rate at which I'm covering their labels, which I wanted to be Q, say 95%, actually wasn't. It, it varied, you know, it was either too big or too small. Okay? And so like, if I find such an update, sorry, if I find such a failure, you know, like a certificate that sort of says, that, look, I'm not satisfying this multi-validity guarantee, I'm just going to patch up the model in this very simple way, you know, like, my, my sort of, there will be some amount that I can shift my predictions on this group such that my coverage rate, you know, will go up to 95% or down to 95%, okay, assuming everything's nice and continuous. Um, so, my, so I'll just like apply this like simple patch where on this group, the sort of the group of people corresponding to the certificate of my failure to satisfy multi-validity, um, you know, I'll just like apply this patch so that now at least on this group, I cover 95% of their labels. And this update will produce the pinball loss of the model. And so this can't go on for very long. And so the theorem is that there's a corresponding theorem for mean multi-calibration you know, on any distribution, on any set of groups, this iterative algorithm runs for only a modest number of steps, one over alpha squared many steps, and outputs a model um, that satisfies an approximate version, alpha approximate version of this multi-coverage guarantee. Yeah? Exactly. So you need randomness in an adversarial setting, which is what I'm going to do Next, but in a distributional setting, you do not. In fact, I read on the airplane yesterday the paper you have with Nika, and I have to figure out exactly how you get rid of the randomness. Maybe we <laughs> talk about that later. Um, but yes, the reason you don't need randomness here is because there's a distribution. Okay, let's talk about the online problem where you do need randomness. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, so, and just to be clear, right, like on any particular example for the final model, some subset of, you know, the groups that you're in will be one, the groups that you're not in will be zero, and so the threshold I use for you is the sum of the lambdas for the groups you're in. So it's like coming up with a parameter for each group, and your threshold is the sum of the parameters for the group you're in. Yes, like it, it had better be for this to yeah. be quantile multi-calibrated. If I use things that were too big, I'd get like 100% coverage. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then just another just general question mm -hmm. is, um, so in the batch MVP procedure, um, what, I'm, what we're doing is we're kind of like looking at our, I guess, calibration data and then like continually residualizing out something. We're like sort of figuring out where there's like pathological groups mm -hmm. adjusting the scores for them. But it's confusing to me how like the new test scores then is exchangeable with the data that you have in your calibration data set. Because you're sort of like, I, I don't understand why there's no double dipping going on, why there's no like it's violation a, of the guarantee. So basically like, um, just as when you find a 95th percentile quantile on your, on your training data, it's very likely to be close to a 95th percentile quantile on your test data. If you find something that is 
um, quantile multi-calibrated on your training data, it's very likely to be close to quantile multi-calibrated on your test data, assuming the data is exchangeable. So there's a generalization theorem that I'm hiding here. It, yeah, you, you need to use the appropriate number of Hufting bounds, and you need to figure out how complicated the models are that this can output, but it's a uniform convergence kind. That's right. So, so you will, it will, in the end, depend somehow logarithmically on the number of groups, and it, you know the guarantees will weaken for smaller groups. It, so nothing, it, there's nothing too surprising in the sort of statistical part of this, in that you get th the same kinds of uniform um, generalization bounds you normally get in, in learning. But you can probably handle BC yes, you could handle BC classes um, if, if you don't like counting the groups. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So the online problem. So there's no distribution anymore. Every day, like a bad guy pictured in the corner here, or maybe he's not bad, but just unexpected, um, he picks an example, x, uh, the features for an example, and also he has in mind some label, y, but he doesn't show it to you. And, um, but he does show you the, the features. As a function of the features and the history, you now get to choose a threshold, which should have the semantics of like what you think is the 95th percentile quantile for the nonconformity score distribution, um, conditional on this x. And then um, you use that threshold to produce the corresponding prediction set. All of the labels whose nonconformity score, when evaluated on this x, are less than the threshold. And then only then does the adversary reveal the label to you. Um, and of course, you learn the nonconformity score. And the goal, there's no distribution here, but the goal is that after I interact with the adversary for t rounds, after all is said and done, when I look at the empirical distribution on example, right, like, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, I can look back and there was this set of, you know, examples, prediction sets I produced on labels, which form some empirical distribution. I would like to have satisfied multi validity on this empirical distribution in the worst case, like e even if the adversary was trying to like stop me from, from satisfying this. Okay. Um, you can do that. Let me, I only have a few minutes, but let me, let me try to go through this uh, just to build some intuition. So you may have heard of zero sum games. They're like a cool kind of game. Um, in zero sum games, there's like minimization, there's a minimization player, there's a maximization player, uh, and they both have um, strategy spaces. There's a utility function that maps the actions of both players to a number. The minimization player would really like it to be small. The maximization player would really like it to be big. Um, here, I'm always going to associate the minimization player with the learner and the maximization player with the adversary. And like the one fact you should know about zero-sum games is the minimax theorem, which informally says the order of play doesn't matter. Okay? If, if I go first and commit to my strategy, and you get to best respond, you can't do any better than if you go first and commit to your strategy and I get to best respond. So that's like the basic fact about zero-sum games. Okay, so the basic idea is to define a game between the learner and the adversary who's, where the utility function is something measuring sort of the multi-validity error at the end of the day. And of course, what's really happening if we have to present an algorithm is the learner goes first. They commit to their strategy. That's the algorithm. And the adversary gets to best respond. But the minimax theorem means to figure out how well the learner can do, we can imagine the roles are reversed and the adversary commits to their strategy, which given a history tells us exactly what is the distribution on labels each day. And the learner gets to best respond. Now prediction, especially prediction of this sort, is very easy if you already know what the distribution is. If I already know what the distribution is, and my goal is to predict 95th percentile quantiles, I can just read off from the distribution what the quantile is. And in this world, it's not hard to show that you will be guaranteed to have very low multi-validity loss at the end of the day. The minimax theorem means non-constructively, there's an algorithm that the learner can play that does just as well uh, in the worst case, even against an arbitrary adversary. Um, OK, what is the theorem you get? Well, OK, so far it's all non-constructive. There's an algorithm um, that can play against an adversary. 
and I can zoom in on any group, on any threshold I predict, and if I look at my deviation from sort of my coverage to my target coverage, which is supposed to be 95%, that'll go to zero at the statistically optimal rate, at a rate of sort of one over square root the size of the group I'm zooming in on. And the reason you get the statistically optimal rate is because when you swap the role of the learner and the adversary, I'm doing exactly the right thing. I'm predicting the true 95th percentile for each point. Okay, the algorithm, oh, that was non-constructive. Sort of the remarkable thing is that you can compute the equilibrium of this game that you analyze to get the non-constructive theorem, and the equilibrium is actually like a nice, efficient closed form algorithm, which I don't have time to tell you more about. Okay, so let me, in the last three minutes, give you sort of this final result, and then I won't show you the experiments. Um, okay, so there's like this landscape of calibration. Um, we know how to do multi-calibration for means. We know how to do multi-calibration for quantiles. What else is there out there? Okay, so a distributional property is just some functional that puts distributions in correspondence with numbers. Okay, so a mean is a distributional pr property. A median, a quantile, a variance, conditional value at risk. There's all sorts of distributional properties. And a predictor, um, which takes as input feature vectors and purports to tell you the value of that property on the conditional label distribution, let's say that it's calibrated, multi-calibrated on some collection of groups. If when I look at the, the conditional distribution, conditional on membership in one of those groups and on the predictor produced by um, my model, that on th that conditional distribution really does have the property value that my model said it did. So this generalized, this is, this is exactly what mean and quantile multi-calibration are. Okay, there's this literature on property elicitation that asks what properties are elicitable. Okay, the, when, when you talk to um, game theoretic, economically minded people, elicitation is sort of framed in terms of my ability to write a contract that incentivizes you to truthfully tell me a property. But f maybe for this audience, it's best viewed as the ability to learn the distributional property by solving a regression problem. Okay, so a, a property is elicitable if there's some loss function such that when I minimize it in expectation over the label distribution, I get the property value back. So means are elicitable because of squared loss, medians are elicitable because of absolute loss, quantiles are elicitable because of pinball loss, and there's other stuff that's not elicitable. Variance, skewness, conditional value at risk, these things are not elicitable. Okay, so, first of all, if a property is not elicitable, it turns out that it doesn't even make sense to ask for even vanilla calibration of that property, um, because, like, like, there might not exist predictors that are calibrated for that property. Even the true distributional pr predictor that really tells you the, you know, given a feature vector x and knows the distribution, really tells you the true conditional um, it, the property on the true conditional distribution on labels given that feature vector might not be calibrated in this way. On the other hand, if it is elicitable, then you can achieve multi-calibration for that property both in the batch and in the online setting using sort of canonical efficient algorithms that are like variants of, of the ones we saw today. Okay. Sometimes something is not elicitable on its own, like variants, but is elicitable conditional on another property, right? So I can't find the variance of a distribution by solving a regression problem, but if you promise me that the mean of the distribution is some fixed value, I can hard code that into my loss function and I can find the variance by solving a regression problem. So the mean is elicitable, the variance is conditionally elicitable given the mean. Quantiles are elicitable, conditional value at risk, which is like a measure of financial risk. It tells me what's the average value of the label in the 5% worst uh, fraction of cases that's conditionally elicitable given um, quantiles. And it turns out if I have two properties, one of which is elicitable and the other of which is conditionally elicitable on the other, I can come up with a two-dimensional predictor that is appropriately calibrated, multi-calibrated on this pair of quantities. Okay. That's all the time I have. These are efficient algorithms. You can run them on real data sets, and we did that, but let me end, <laughs> and thank you for listening. Hi. 
Um, thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, going back to the batch mode with groups, um, a, a practical question that comes up is, given the amount of data I have, how, how fine can I choose these groups? Um, do you have any like rules of thumb or kind of scaling considerations yeah. about how to do so, that? So like informally, like, um, it's possible to, so when you look at, for example, the, right, like, ultimately the guarantees we're giving are when we zoom in on some subset of the distribution, like membership in some group cross prediction of some threshold, like our deviation from um, perfect coverage, you know, 95% coverage will be small. Well, what does small mean? What you can get is like one over square root the size of the group you're zooming in on. So um, if you try doing this for teeny tiny groups, it'll be a very weak guarantee. Now, the nice thing about the, f the fact that the groups can intersect means you can handle lots and lots of groups even if none of them are teeny tiny, right? Like if I had to, if I only knew how to handle disjoint groups, then one way to handle intersecting groups would be to take all of the, you know, K-way intersections and now I have disjoint groups, but these groups are all tiny. Here, I could have a whole bunch of groups, maybe each one is like half the population, but I could have like thousands of them and they intersect and now and then you'd get good, strong guarantees for all of them. So it's basically lots of groups is no problem. What is a problem, but for sort of fundamental reasons that you can't hope to, like fundamental statistical reasons that you can't hope to fix is if those groups are tiny. language we want to use for in real life uh, with I mean gr you know as you alluded to I could be in all kinds of weird groups and um, whenever I see kind of sharp boundaries I kind of like to smooth them out I'd like to kind of be able to plot myself down in some kind of metric space and sort of say anything around me is is you know yeah good enough and if there's no group that's quite right I want to kind of say I'm a little bit like that group a little bit like that group and is that what is the eventual language I, I don't I doubt it'll be just there's a list of groups and you belong to one. Yeah, it's a good question. One thing that's maybe worth mentioning is that, like if you look at all the actual algorithms, um, like they don't deal directly with groups as sets. They deal with groups as these like functions that I described as indicator functions. It turns out all of these algorithms still work if you think of these uh, like functions as mapping to zero or one. So if you want to think about fractional membership in different groups, that's fine. Um, but, yeah. But like, Is there any kind of coherency property that are kind of, you know, implicit here? Or, um, I guess your algorithm just kind of, if there's an intersection, you, you it, it satisfies both. Yeah, I mean, there's a way to view what's going on, at least for means, as sort of, if, if you generalize these sort of groups to like real-valued functions. Um, it's like a, these are boosting algorithms where the groups are like your class of weak learners. And, and so like you can go down that road and you can characterize properties that the groups should have such that multi-calibration with respect to those groups implies Bayes optimality. So, so at some point, you know, the group structure just like captures what you needed to learn. Um, but I, yeah, it's a good enough question that I don't think I have a complete answer to it. No, it's really it's interesting because you're in the middle between building models versus evaluating models. Right, and I think original calibration work like Dean Foster or whatever was kind of just evaluate models, sort of show that it's, or fix up an existing model. But if you start to do all this stuff that you're doing, you're starting getting almost to the final algorithm. You don't need to have a kind of a, any other algorithm that you're fixing up. You're, you're just getting an algorithm. That's, yeah. That's very non-parametric, no assumptions. Although like, you know, to get good generalization bounds, it is nice if the thing that you're doing, like, like what you can do is you can train some complicated model and then you can sort of fix it up. And to the extent that you're fixing it up in a simple way with simple groups, you get sort of good out of sample uncertainty quantification properties. You could have trained a complicated model in this way from the beginning, but then uh, general, th then they, this, this family of algorithms tends to sort of aggressively overfit if you um, aren't careful. So there's some merit to sort of doing the complicated fitting in sort of more traditional ways and, but anyway. The eventual thing is there's a big black box that's really great at some predictions and I'm gonna then fix it up. And that's gonna be what way I communicate to an actual user is that everything is in a, you know, yeah, calibrated in a way that you now can make good decisions. Yeah, so, so I mean, all of this stuff is still, 
up in the air. Like, it, you know, like in, in your paper, you seem to give like good generalization theorems with, that, that sort of get the right sort of root n that sort of we can get in like this online setting, but you like get rid of the randomness. So, so like there is the possibility that, generaliz that, that you can have variants of these algorithms that generalize better than the ones I've run experiments on. Um, you know, like Michael's first paper on all of this was just in 2018. So like, um, it's possible that everything is better than we think. Um, but I will say that sort of straightforward implementations of the algorithms as I've presented them work well for relatively simple group structures and start overfitting for really complicated ones. So we're, we're, we're recording, so that's why they're asking me to. So I, algorithmically, you're doing this kind of like boosting thing, and I'm guessing you're, you're building out these predictors in the way you normally do boosting. But I guess I was curious, in the experiments, how do these like confidence sets end up? Like, is there some intuition or like sort of like general patterns that happen when you have lots of groups and you're trying to like aggregate? Um, um, yes. Yeah, so, Empirically, I guess, um, you know, so this is um, on census data with, with sort of the um, uh, gender and, and racial categories in the census data. Um, these algorithms converge much more quickly than the theory would suggest. Like there's, you know, like the theory says if you want, you know, 1% calibration error, it could take, you know, um, 10,000 rounds or something. It's more like seven rounds. Um, and so you end up getting very good performance. So if you sort of, I don't have time to explain the whole like experiment, but basically like, you know, here we're aiming for like 90% coverage, um, which is this red line here. Um, this is looking at group conditional coverage. Um, the sort of, the, the, the first like one shot algorithm that promises group conditional coverage, that's this like light blue line. And it basically always gets it exactly right on all of the groups. Um, so, so this is for a simple group structure, you know, like this is sort of, uh, these are groups that are defined by single features in the census data. Um, they, they intersect. Um, it works very well for simple groups. If you start doing this with where, where your groups are all depth four decision trees, which you can do algorithmically, um, you start getting gaps, it, you know, it does perfectly on the training data, but like on the test data, you get serious gaps, which I, to make these things more, but, like this is a problem that might be fixable. Like it might not be inherent to the goal, but like at least the algorithms that I've played with currently have sort of an overfitting problem when the groups become complicated. Right. More questions? Okay. Thank you again, Aaron. Come on. Thanks.